morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time tuning in with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event, we are all about bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. If you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, you'll find that we host 30, 40, even 50 or more live events a month for classrooms to join into. You can sign up, join in, tune in live via YouTube. You can grab camera spots and interact. We're really excited and hope to see your classrooms soon. All right, well, October is coming to an end. This is our last broadcast day of what has been a crazy month of over 60 live uh, events, uh, celebrating space exploration, but also diving into all kinds uh, of other things from the world of science, exploration, engineering, uh, adventure, and beyond. So really excited to be heading over to the United Kingdom. We are going to be joined today by Roma uh, Agrawal. She is a structural engineer with a physics degree. So she's always loved science and design, uh, and she found engineering was a great way to bring those two worlds together. She's designed bridges, skyscrapers, sculptures, um, over the course of her 14 year career. And she spent six years working on the Shard, which is the tallest building in Western Europe, particularly uh, the part called the Spire. So she loves to present with students. She loves um, to talk about engineering uh, and share what it's like to be a woman in a male dominated field. She's been featured in all kinds of different publications, things like the BBC Daily, TEDx, Sunday Times, and more. And we're so lucky to have her joining us live here today. So I'm gonna bring Roma live in with us. Roma, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks for having me. All right, well, it's great to have you joining us today. Um, yeah, we're really excited to learn a little bit more about uh, yourself and some of the projects that you've worked on. I myself have visited London several times and the Shard is just this kind of iconic piece that you can't help but just kind of be drawn to when you're kind of walking along the, the river. Uh, Thames in London. So we're thrilled to have you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to talk to all of you today. And um, I'm, I'm so happy that you've all dialed in. So what I'm going to do is I've got some slides that I'm going to share with you, um, which I think you can now see. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself, my journey into engineering, um, one of the projects I worked on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, some secrets and some exciting things about how we actually built the shard. And we're gonna have some time for questions after that. So I hope you enjoy this. So I'll always like to start off with these little photographs and you might look at those photographs and think, oh, Roma always knew she wanted to be an engineer because I am wearing my dad's suit in one of the pictures. My dad was an engineer. Um, did anybody else wear their dad's clothes or just me? mum's clothes maybe <laughs> um, and I also loved playing with blocks and I loved building stuff I loved breaking stuff and these are bristle blocks which I'm sure many of you may have seen or maybe I'm a child of the 80s and you haven't but I actually grew up I was in um, Ithaca New York till I was seven years old um, and so these are photographs actually from from North America so a little bit about me then so I, I you know I was in 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 the United States states until i was about seven i moved to india after that and when i was in india i always loved at school studying science and maths and there's a lot of emphasis and a lot of prestige on scientific and mathematical careers in india so it always seemed like quite a natural fit for me i quite liked it um, and so when i moved to the uk when i was 16 and i did my a levels here which is the equivalent of high school I decided to study maths, further maths, physics, and design and technology. Um, and I really loved all those things. But I didn't really know what I wanted to study at university. So unlike in the US, in the UK, we have to select what degree we want to do when, when we're 17 years old. And it's really difficult to make a decision that quickly. But I decided to study physics because I, I really liked physics. And I also realized that if you know physics and all the maths that underpins it, you can pretty much do any job you want. And I really, really mean that. I know musicians and doctors and scientists and engineers like myself who have all studied physics. And then I was lucky enough to have a summer job um, during my physics degree where I was working with engineers. And what I realized while I was surrounded by these engineers is that they bring 
that theoretical physics, but practical real world stuff kind of together. And I decided that's what I want to do. I want to use maths and physics to make stuff. And that's, that's engineering. So I am a structural engineer. And maybe some of you have heard of structural engineering. Maybe some of you haven't. So in simple terms, my job is to make sure that buildings and bridges stand up. OK, so when you think about whatever structure you're sitting in, maybe you're at home, maybe you're in a library, maybe you're at school. If you just look up, look up at the ceiling and think about the fact the ceiling's not falling on your head and think about the walls around you. The walls are not crushing. They're not falling down. It's because an engineer like me has done some maths to make sure that the structure is safe. OK, so that's what my job is. So what does that actually mean? So I work with architects. So a lot of people think architecture and structural engineering is quite similar. So it can be. They're quite different. I work with architects. I help them make their designs um, real so that they can stand up in the world against gravity and wind. Um, one thing that I was surprised by is how much teamwork there is with engineering. So engineering is not about sitting behind your computer and working by yourself for hours. I'm always in meetings. I'm meeting people. We're discussing things. And I'm also doing lots of art and sketching because that seems to be a bit of a shared language between different types of you know, engineers and architects. So if you love drawing and art, fantastic. You can make a great engineer. Um, as I've become more and more senior in my job, I've been working for nearly 15 years now, um, I've started managing projects. So I've got all these different threads in my head, like, oh, we need to get this permission and we need to get that material on site and we need to think about this design and just put it all together and make sure it all happens. And I really love the buzz of that as well. Um, and I've worked on a whole different range of projects, like Joe mentioned. I've done a footbridge. You can see a little picture of my footbridge. I've worked on the shard, which I'm going to tell you about, um, and other stuff as well. But as I mentioned, I'm actually right now not working strictly as an engineer, but as an author. So I can tell you a bit more about that later. So I do structural engineering, which is kind of one teeny bit of engineering. And if you just think about your mor morning so far, you might be at home, you hopefully um, had a shower or a bath and you ate something and maybe you sat in a car or took a train or a bus to get somewhere. And when you think about it, all of that stuff is engineering. And as a structural engineer, I'm mainly involved in the top one in designing homes, bridges, buildings, things like that. But if you're interested in um, also the big challenges that our world faces right now, like the climate emergency, how do we generate energy more cleanly? How do we get enough food to everyone around the world? How do we build enough housing that's safe for everyone, especially when it's flooding and there's disasters? If you're passionate about any of those things, then engineering can be a way for you to think about solving those problems. So um, without further ado, let's talk a bit about the Shard. So if you haven't been to London, that big, tall, pointy glass thing that you can see in this picture is the building. It is the tallest building in the UK and in fact in Western Europe. I have to say that by um, American standards, um, it's about average tall for Manhattan. But for us, we're very, very excited by it. And we, we like the shape. It's a cool shape. And so that made it challenging to build as well. So um, me, myself, I started working on the Shard when I was one year into my career and I was the most junior engineer out of this big team of engineers. And I was lucky enough to work on the foundation of the building. So the foundation of the building is the thing that holds it all up from the ground. And I worked on the spire, which is that top pointy bit where you can go and look at the views if you're in London. And then I also helped manage the project while it was in construction. And this was all back in something like 2012, 2013. And since then, I've been spending a lot of time talking to people like you about our work. So let us look at the Shard in the context of some other towers. So the One World Trade Center in New York is 541 meters or 1,776 feet tall. And the Shard is 306 meters tall, just to give you an idea of that scale that I was talking about. So what are the things that we need to think about as structural engineers when we're designing a tower? 
we need to think about the forces that are acting on it. And one of the forces is the wind. So if you think about standing in your city on a windy day and think about that wind force kind of pushing on your building. So we need to make sure that the towers are stable and strong enough so that they can stand up. And we almost take inspiration from trees for many of our buildings. So if you think about a tree trunk, um, buildings like the Shard have a really tall spine made of concrete going through the middle, but it's not a solid spine. It's a spine which has lots of shafts going through it. And through those shafts are the lifts and the escape stairways and so on. But we use the outer skin of that structure to act as the backbone of the tower. So that's one way that we can look at the stability of a building. The other thing we need to think about is gravity. So obviously wind acts horizontally and gravity is pulling everything downwards. So if you had a really soft material like wet sand um, or clay like we have in London, we need to stop the building from sinking. Um, because we don't want people coming to look at our building because it's tilting like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. That's, that's not what we want. Or you might have really strong, hard material like rock. And that's what Manhattan has. And I think parts of Chicago as well. And that's why those were some of the cities with the earliest skyscrapers is because the ground was really, really strong and it was easy to build these huge structures on them. So... With the shard, we had a layer of what we call made ground, which is kind of rubbishy materials that are just on the top of the ground. And then we had a big, thick layer of clay, which you can see in yellow. And then below that was a, you know, a hard level of sand called the thanet sand. And that's really, really hard. It's really compressed. And so when we built our foundations, what we did was you can see those big yellow columns underneath that slab, and those are called concrete piles and they're basically long columns that we we kind of drill into the ground and then we pour concrete into the ground and all of those yellow piles basically went to the top of that compressed sand so that it could get you know really supported it's like being on stilts really um when you're building a basement so this is a picture of the basement of the shard you normally dig a big hole go down lay the foundations and then go up when you're constructing. But there were two things. One is that we needed to build quickly. And the second thing is that London is a really busy historical city. So around the site of the Shard, we had so many different structures and we had to be really, really careful that while we're digging deep to build the foundations, that these structures around us wouldn't start shifting and moving. So we used a technique that's called top down construction. And that's a special technique where you basically start at ground and you dig downwards and you build upwards at the same time. So you remember I talked about the spine, which is the core of the building, which gives it its stability. That's what you can see in green on the screen. And you can see a kind of a wall surrounding it, which looks red. So that's interlocking piles which form the basically like the bathtub, the side of the bathtub, which is the basement. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we built this and what top-down construction is. So what we did, which was really unusual, was we built the concrete piles from ground levels. So we dug down, poured concrete in, but then we put these absolutely massive steel columns into the concrete piles. I'm going to tell you why in a second. So if you look at this image here, you can't see the top of the piles because they're you know flush with the ground. And then the steel columns have gone in. And now you can see that on the bottom left corner of your screen, they're starting to lay the ground floor concrete slab. OK. And then what we did was we dug below the ground floor concrete slab. And then you could expose these steel columns that you had put inside those piles. And the reason for that is that we attach the rig so that where it says the shard in black, that's the huge rig that we put together to build the spine or the core of the tower. And what this meant is that they could start building upwards while underneath. So this is the this is like if you've crawled under a hole and you're looking 
underneath the core, you can see those steel columns I talked about. You can see the concrete piles kind of broken, which held them. And at this point in the build, there were 20 stories of the core above what you can see. And there was no foundation complete. So they had these piles, but that's not a complete foundation. And the entire structure was basically standing on these stilts. And that was really super cool. And this saved us a whole stack of time um, on construction. So you can see here now as things went on, that's the core going up. And then ar around the base of the core, you can see the steel beams coming in and kind of attaching into the core. And then that's where we lay the floors down. So that's what you stand on when you go and visit the Shard. So I just quickly want to tell you a little bit about the viewing gallery. So I talked a bit about the foundations that's under the ground. Nobody can see that. So we had particular challenges we needed to work with when we were managing that. But the spire, which is, you can kind of see the skeleton of it on the screen, um, was very, very different because this is where the viewing platform for the tower is. So if you come as a tourist and you buy some tickets, you basically stand at that first or the second level of blue that you can see on your screen. And all the steel here is exposed. You can see all of it. So we had to make sure it looked amazing. Um, and that's the kind of view you can see over London. So that's taken with a big you know, fish eye lens to try and absorb as much of the view as you can. Um, and, and yes, the River Thames um, always looks pretty brown and, and mucky. It's not, it's not a very beautiful color, but it's a nice river anyway. So what is special about the spire? What's, now, what was tricky about this was that we were building from steel. We were the highest up in London that anyone has ever built, ever. And it's, it's dangerous, it's windy. Um, and so we had to think about how can we build this? The other thing to think about is, you know, London hasn't got very nice weather. And so out of a week, 70% of the time that you could use a crane was lost. You know, we couldn't use the crane because it's too windy, it's unsafe. So we had to think about how can we build this quickly? So that is a bird's eye view of one of the floors of the shard and each of the black lines is a steel beam. So that's what it would look like. And ordinarily you would lift each one of these beams up and then you'd put them all together. But what we did was to turn it almost into like a Lego set. So we split it into these modules that you can see. And each one of those modules was built in a factory. So we needed to make sure that each of these modules was light enough so that the crane could pick it up. So we had a limit of seven tons. And we also had to make sure that the size and shape of it was such that it could be put into a truck so that they could drive it from the north of England where the factory was down to London. So these are the kind of real world things that you need to think about when you're actually designing a structure. So this is a photo of a test build that they did. So they actually built the top little bit of the shard in a field in the north of England before doing it in London on top of the tower. Because what they did here was they checked that all these different pieces, all the modules fit together really, really well so that they knew when they came to London and did it up in the sky that it would be done safely. So that is, um, sorry, excuse me. Um, that is a steel fixer, and what he is doing is putting some bolts in to basically bind that steel together. Now, I am pretty scared of heights, and you would have to pay me, like, I don't know, $5 million to go up and do that job. I, I just, I couldn't do it. But, but this guy loved it. So that is a picture of the very last piece of steel of the shard coming into place. Um, and they sent a helicopter over to take some photographs and some videos. So I'm nearly done. Um, and then we're going to go to questions. So get ready with your questions. What I think is really special about engineering is that you're using maths and science. And, and that's great. Um, you don't have to be amazing at maths and science to be an engineer. You just have to be good enough because 
what the beauty of engineering is that you also have to be really creative. And what I mean by that creativity is I talked a bit about being good at art and being good at drawing and sketching. And that's really important. But you also be able to look at a situation and think, how can I do this in a new way that's never been done before that will make this build safer, better, quicker, cheaper, whatever that might be. Um, and so there's a lot of creativity involved in that. I also really, really love the fact that I'm always surrounded by people. So I love working with other people. I love bouncing ideas off each other. So, so writing, I actually find quite stressful and lonely sometimes because I, I can't bounce ideas as much as I normally do in my engineering job. Um, so that's a bit strange. And I think the last message I want to leave you with is to be curious, is to keep looking around you and to just think about what there is, like what are the materials underneath your feet? Are there pipes under you? Are there trains running underground? You know, what is this brick made of? Where did that material come from? And just keep asking yourself all these questions because it's a really, really fascinating um, world that we live in if you do that. So so that's a, a picture of the proud team of engineers that were that built the Shard, and that's the very, very top level of the building, um, which is very exciting. And just before I leave you to questions, um, I wrote a book called Built, which has loads of stories of amazing structures. There's bits on the shop, but there's bits about buildings and stuff all over the world. So that's what the book looks like if you're in the rest of the world. And if you're in America or Canada, then that's what the, what the book looks like. Um, and if you can't get hold of the book, then I have a podcast, which is called Building Stories Podcast. I've got the um, Twitter and Instagram handle there, so you can find the website. You can download it from wherever. And there's three episodes, which are completely free. Um, and I hope you really enjoy it. So thank you so much. All right. Well, Roma, thank you so much for that awesome presentation. Um, wow, what a build. It looked like, uh, you know, just a great mix of having to come up with new ideas, uh, test things, make sure they're going to work in, in complicated situations. Did you find you spent a lot of time while it was built on site? Um, yeah, I did. And I really, really loved that. So the shard was on, was in construction for four or five years while they were, de you know, demolishing the building that was there before. And then they went into, um, you know, this, this whole construction of going up. And then even once the tower was complete, they were still fitting in all the stuff that actually goes inside the building. So it was really, really amazing to see, you know, your little drawings and sketches that you do actually become this huge, big, real thing. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, so we're going to start meeting some of our live groups. We've got uh, groups live on camera with us who will ask some questions. We've got a lot of classrooms as well on YouTube who are starting to send in some questions. Right. And in fact, let's start off with one of the questions uh, from some McCartney's group. They're wondering why you chose engineering as a career field? Yeah, so that was um, one of those strange things that I was just lucky enough to happen upon. Um, I, you know, I studied physics, like I said. I always wanted to do something scientific, but also I wanted to do something that, that you know, would leave some kind of imprint on the world where I would have like a real thing or an object that I was gonna make. And engineering kind of brought those two things together for me. All right. We have the SNP STEAM Academy, a grade 12 construction class. They're joining us live in the call. They sent in a few questions via the chat. Um, Ooh, yeah, you can see those. Yeah, I really like number two. We're here, I'm here in Canada as well. Uh, and so, you know, the CN Tower is quite a, a famous structure uh, in Toronto. So did you research other structures like that when you were... Uh, you know, thinking about the shard and the spire in particular. Yeah, so I'm I'm just really fascinated by skyscrapers from all over the world, and there's a great website which is called CTBUH, um, which is a council for tall buildings and urban habitat. And I used to kind of look at all the different buildings in there, look at all their heights. Um, I'll tell you some of the towers that I really love that are quite interesting. So I love the. Um, Oh God, the name's gone out of my head now. It'll come back to me, but there's a tower in Chicago that was built by an engineer called Fazlur Khan. Um, I want to say John Hopkins Tower, but I might be wrong. And, and that's got these big, huge kind of crosses on the outside. 
And that's a different stability system than we used on the Shard. So yeah, we researched different buildings, different heights, what kind of stability system would be right for it? What kind of materials would we use? And we had to think about all of those different things when we were putting together the skeleton of the building. Okay, uh, great question. We'll work in uh, maybe another one or two of those too. So that group's joining us in Brantford, uh, Ontario, the construction class, very cool. We're gonna head over now to uh, Homestead, Florida. We've got uh, Mr. Delgado's group joining us. Let me bring them into the call. How are we doing today, Florida? Hi, we are great. We, um, in a, a, a come to um, to uh, London, we have nice weather. <laughs> so we have really pretty weather up today, especially. Um, but uh, I have a high school group of IB um, students who are uh, wondering, since it is such, they have great questions coming, so it's hard for me to pick and choose. But um, the most dominant one is, uh, since it is a male-dominated field, did you find it difficult to communicate um, and have your voice heard? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's it's a complicated one to answer as well. So I have been working in this industry for about fifteen years now, and what I'll say is, you know, on the positive side, things are changing and getting better. I have to say, when I first started, so this was back in two thousand and five people still had naked pictures of women on the walls in the construction site. But I can assure you that I haven't seen any one of those and, and it's completely frowned upon now kind of for the last 10 years. So, so that's the positive thing that things are changing. And it's still common for me to be the only woman in the room, the only person of color in the room and often definitely the only woman of color um, in a room. And I, I would say it did affect my confidence in the beginning because I just assumed that everybody else around me knew exactly what they were talking about. And I was, you know, I didn't have enough experience. I didn't have enough confidence to speak up. But slowly, as I got more and more confident, as I got further in my career, then those kind of feelings went away. So it's good if you get a nice mentor or a nice boss, some encouragement. I would also just say that the, the ability to communicate and to speak to all sorts of different people is an extremely useful skill to have. Um, so yeah, bring that. And I can really tell you that as a woman, you can really thrive in engineering. All right. Well, I mean, that's fascinating to hear, you know, how things have changed in the last couple of decades. It's great to hear that um, they're changing for the better. Um, but I think you're right. There's still, there's still work there's to be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Lewis's sixth graders are joining us via YouTube and they're wondering about uh, the biggest challenge that your team faced during that construction project of the Shard. That's, that's a great question. Thank you, year six. So I would say that, you know, okay, building a tall tower is a challenge in itself, right? It's hard. But actually, I think that the biggest challenge was what was going around the tower. So if you've been to London, or if you've seen pictures of London, it's a really busy city. So around the Shard site, we had a train station on one side, which had been built in the 1800s. We had a bus station that had been built in the 1960s. We had a hospital across the street, you know, and I could imagine that the surgeons wouldn't be very happy if we were demolishing things and there were big loud bangs and crashes while they're doing surgery, probably not great. We had underground train tunnels running near this very, very close to the site. And yeah, the train station is the busy, one of the busiest stations in the whole country. So you have millions of people there every single day. And then the logistics of bringing in all the concrete, all the steel, all the materials and the labor that you needed. For me, that was the biggest challenge, was managing the logistics and managing all of these different structures and people that were around the tower, making sure that all those structures remain safe throughout the build. All right, very cool. And a great question from our grade sixes. So here uh, in Canada, grade six, we have a big structures unit in our science curriculum. So uh, great to have them tuning in and learning a little bit about engineering and structures. Uh, okay, we're gonna go to uh, another group, Mrs. Cullen's group, they're joining us um in michigan today let me bring them into the call here hey miss cullen how are you 
Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, can you grab the mic for us? <laughs> you think I'd be used to that by now? <laughs> yes, thank you for, for doing this and sharing what you're learning. Um, I was asking them if they had any questions and they are like silent right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what what does anybody want to know? Yeah, I we were There's trying no to think pressure. I can come back to you. I know. I thank you. Yeah, go ahead and um, return. It looks like we have some good ones in the chat. Oh, and they said someone doesn't want to know what is your least favorite part of engineering. That is a very good. I love that question. My least favorite part of engineering. Okay, so if you remember the answer I just gave you, and I was telling you about all of these different people and structures around the building that you're actually working on, it can be really difficult to convince those people that what you're doing is safe, what you're doing won't affect them too badly. And I mean, ultimately, construction sites can be quite noisy and messy and a lot of people don't like having them in their neighborhoods or near them. So I find in some ways that's my least favorite part of the job is having to go around and convince people that don't want your project or don't like your project that, you know, what's the long term benefit going to be and why is it good in the long term? So, yeah, I think that would probably be my least favorite bit, <laughs> but it's an important bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, we've got a virtual class. I believe this is our group in Toronto. Is this our class in Toronto? Uh, yes, it is. Awesome. Great to have you joining us today. Uh, do they have a question or two for us? Yeah, there's a couple of questions. Um, the first is, what are the most challenging materials to use from a structural perspective? And the second one, is there a meaningful uh, shift towards using more environmentally friend friendly materials in engineering? And if so, can you talk to us about that? Great, thank you. These are very, very important and great questions. Thank you. So the materials we use most frequently are steel and concrete. Now, if I asked you to guess what is the thing that humans consume the most of in the whole world? The number one is water, which makes sense, right? We need to drink it to live. Number two is concrete. And I think that's an incredibly like mind blowing statistic. And it's because concrete is used all over the world to build structures. It's really strong. It's really robust. Um, but it's got it. It's not very eco friendly in some ways. Um, in terms of the most challenging materials to work with, I would say for me, it would be glass because glass is very brittle. So it just snaps or it shatters and crumbles if it gets overloaded. Steel and concrete are a little bit different because steel is ductile, so it has a little bit of flex in it, so it kind of will move before it crashes. And because we mix steel and concrete together, the steel also helps to bind concrete. Glass is the tricky one. If you want to make like a really pure glass structure, I would say that that's the trickiest material um, to work with. So in terms of eco-friendliness, the bit of concrete that makes it not eco-friendly is the cement powder which you mix in with the water and the other stuff because producing cement produces a lot of carbon but considering how much concrete we use that is why the concrete industry produces so much carbon so there is a little bit of a balancing act to think about there but yeah definitely we need to move towards more eco-friendly material and i think the one that we're coming back to is timber is wood and especially in North America, timber and wood are easy to get, easy to regrow, and we're seeing a lot more structures coming. So in fact, I don't know the name of the building, but I think Canada has one of the tallest and the biggest structures built out of wood. So people are investigating how to build skyscrapers out of wood, which I think is quite exciting. All right, so we've got a couple of great questions coming in via YouTube that uh, I want to work in. Let me just back things up a little bit to find uh, the one. Where did it go? Okay, I'm going to look for the one that I was looking for. But oh, yeah, here it is. It's about vortices. Um, so we have a class who's tuning in and they were wondering, you know, what did you have to kind of think about uh, with that, especially so there we go. So how did you reduce the strength of vortices on the building, the impact, especially, yeah. you know, high off the ground like that. 
Absolutely, great question. Um, so where do I start? So we talked about wind, talked about stability. So that's to kind of keep the building safe and stable. What really affects vortices in a skyscraper is the shape of the building. So if you had a, um, it just came back to me, that tower I was talking about was the John Hancock Tower, not the John Hopkins, Tower, John Hancock Tower in Chicago. So the John Hancock Tower in Chicago has really sharp edges. It's like a rectangular or a square building. And the sharp corners and edges basically create lots and lots of vortices. But if you have a smoother shape, then you reduce it. So for example, with the shard, the fact that, yeah, it's faceted, but it's got a softer profile because they're angled, that meant that the vortices weren't quite that bad. So even, you know, the higher you go, the stronger the wind forces are. What we did is we tested the tower, a model of the tower in a wind tunnel. So if you imagine, if you watch like motorsport, then um, you'll know that they blow wind over cars to see how the wind is kind of flowing over the car to see how they can reduce the vortices. And we did tests like that in a wind tunnel. And we even, um, so I don't have a picture of the shard in front of me right now, but if you look at the shard, there's little canopies that stick out towards the bottom of the shard. And those canopies are actually there to break up the vortices that kind of swoosh down the side of the building. So the canopies break up those vortices before it can like sweep a person off their feet at the base of the tower. So there's lots of different things that we thought about, but the short answer is stick it in the wind tunnel machine and figure out what the problems are. All right, fair enough. I just did a quick um, look at those Canada skyscrapers. So it looks like the West Coast is, is where they're being built. There's an 18 story um, Brock Commons Tower in Vancouver. Uh, and then a 40 story one plan called the Earth Tower in Vancouver as well. Amazing. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And so that brought a question from our group in Michigan they just put into the chat. Um, with that use of wood, is there a way to mitigate the risk of fire? That is a very good question and it's a tricky one. So there are a couple of things that we can do. One is to kind of impregnate the wood itself with chemicals that help make it fireproof. But those chemicals are generally quite nasty. And so when you talk about being eco-friendly, they're not great because you've got a nice eco-friendly material, but then you're putting horrible chemicals into it. But that's one option. Um, another option is that certain species of wood, when they burn, the outside layer of the wood gets charred, it goes black, but then it becomes like an insulating layer and it actually stops the rest of the wood from burning, at least for long enough to get people out safely. So what we can do as engineers is we can, when we figure out what size the column needs to be to take all the weight of the building, we can make it a little bit bigger so that that little bit of wood on the outside will char, but then we know that there's still enough good wood in the middle to take the loads. So that's another way we can think about it. Or the other way is to put boards inside the building. So if you put up like, gypsum boards or plaster boards that it just protects the structure and stops the structure from coming in contact with the fire in the first place okay so any of our camera classrooms give me a wave if you want me to come back for another question i'm going to grab one from the chat from the snp steam academy our grade 12s and they're wondering uh if you've ever encountered a stage in a project where the plans just weren't possible you had the plans everything you know was coming together and then it was whoa this didn't work <laughs> So luckily it's never been that bad because we spend so long planning and planning and planning and anticipating every problem that we can think of before we start a build. So that usually takes care of most stuff. And then also because we're working with engineers that have loads of experience, they'll say, oh yeah, I remember that thing that happened on that building, or we can just learn things from other structures where things went wrong. Um, and we try and make sure that nothing can go wrong. Having said that, things can happen. We know that structures sometimes collapse and they can have really devastating consequences. And I'll just give you a tiny, tiny little example of something that happened on the show that was different than we expected, which was that the ground, um, we measured how deep the clay was and we did that kind of stuff from the sides, then we demolished the building and then we did more tests. And then we found that there was actually a fault in the really deep layers of ground from the ice age, which meant that 
the layers of um, of sand and clay kind of went and then went and then went that you know sideways again. So luckily, all it meant for us is that we had to make some of our foundations a bit deeper, and we could solve the problem. Um, so usually, because we've done so much prep work, massive things don't happen, and you know, if little things do happen, we can accommodate them. Okay. Well, last call for our camera classes. Give me a wave if you want me to visit one more time. Uh, but I do have a good question that I think is a fun one to wrap up on. And Haley is wondering uh, via the chat if um, what your happiest or engineering memory is. Is there something that really stands out that you go back to? Yes. Um, and I've written about it in my book, actually. It was I, I came out of London Bridge Station. And I basically went through this tiny little door, which led into the construction site of the Shard. Um, and then I kind of made my way up. And it was the first time that I stood on level 87 of the tower. And I was on my own that day, wearing my hard hat and my my jacket. And I just stood there and I, I was standing there. First of all, I had designed that steel floor that I was standing on and that felt kind of weird. And I just looked out at the view and I thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe that all these years years of work have brought me to this stage. And, and that was really, really memorable to me. So I always kind of come back to that memory when I'm frustrated at work. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Well, I wanna start off with a huge shout out to all the classrooms that joined us live via YouTube today. Thank you for sending in those awesome questions, especially our grade six classes in Canada uh, who are studying structures right now. So, so glad that you could join us. I want to give a shout out to our camera groups joining us in Canada and the US. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I know ch it's challenging sometimes to be doing it virtually, but we'd love to have the classrooms joining. And Roma, thank you so much. What a great, what a great story today. Uh, an amazing career you have. And you know, thanks for being a trailblazer and sharing your experiences with uh, with our students today. Thank you. And Joe, a big thank you to you for everything you're doing. I know that all the students and teachers must be so grateful that um, that they've got you to, to share their knowledge with. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Roma. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Uh, classrooms out there, enjoy your weekends as well. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Thanks, everyone.